In Climate Watch, pollutants and warming waters are threatening to destroy Florida's diverse and fragile ecosystems. Scientists are now looking for, to nature for solutions to this man-made dilemma. CBS News meteorologist and climate specialist Jeff Baradelli investigates. We've had hundreds of manatees that literally have starved to death. In his 45 years as a biologist, Pat Rose, director of the Save the Manatee Club, has never seen anything like this. This past year, over 1,000 manatees have died. That's 15% of the Florida population. Manatees are kind of the early warning uh, species, if you will, like the canary in the coal mine. They're telling us that the system is really in trouble. The trouble in the Indian River Lagoon is the disappearance of seagrass, manatees' favorite food. Scientists say escalating algae blooms are to blame, partly from warming waters, but mainly from nutrient pollution. So all this nutrient enrichment is causing these algae blooms and that's clouding out the sun from getting it, that's killing the seagrass? Absolutely, we've had much too much of it. For over a decade, it's actually been getting worse. Rose says the excess nutrients are coming from human waste and fertilizer runoff. There are hundreds of thousands of septic tanks that some of them are leaking these you know, pollutants into our waterways and everybody has a lawn. How do you change that? It seems like an insurmountable problem. It's a huge problem. That algae problem is just as pervasive further south and west. In the Tampa Bay area, a massive red tide outbreak this past summer left nearly 2,000 tons of dead fish, turtles, and manatees rotting on the shorelines. You can see it all around the structure right here. Howard, if you maybe loop around. Dr. Steve Davis is the chief science officer of the Everglades Foundation. He accompanied us on a tour high above Lake Okeechobee, generously provided to us by our pilot Howard Greenberg and Lighthawk, a nonprofit aiming to accelerate environmental conservation. It's all here below us. All this neon colored water is uh, that, that toxin forming blue green algae. It looks like waves here. Toxic algae blooms now plague the lake every summer as the water heats up and tropical downpours wash nutrients into Okeechobee. So for decades, that lake has been gathering nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen, and now it's coming back to haunt us? It is, um, to the point where this year, the you know 700 square mile Lake Okeechobee was covered, 90% of it was covered. Florida's water woes can be traced all the way back to the Okeechobee hurricane of 1928, when up to 20 feet of water overflowed onto communities south of the lake, killing 2,500 people. Shortly after, the Herbert Hoover Dyke was built around the lake to protect residents from flooding. But the dike also traps nutrient pollution flowing south into Okeechobee from agriculture and communities along the Kissimmee River Basin. In summer, the lake fills up from rain. To avoid overflow, water is released into canals which lead east and west, polluting populated coastal communities. Toxic algae blooms often follow, annihilating the ecosystem and devastating the economy. If you've ever experienced it, it, it literally takes your breath away. You feel sick uh, almost instantaneously. Uh, and then the impacts that it has translating from there to uh, tourism to the economy, uh, as well as the fisheries, just the, the impacts that it has on fish kills and marine mammals is, is really incredible. Florida has been working to solve this for more than 20 years through a joint state and federal effort called Everglades Restoration. The idea is to restore the natural flow of water to the Everglades, which for decades has been blocked by the dike and sugarcane fields on the south side. These projects help divert less of the polluted water to the east and west and instead allow more water to be filtered by the wetlands to the south. From high up, we got a first-hand look at the projects. We're transitioning out of these sugar fields into one of the, the 17,000 acre treatment marshes. This is a wetland that captures stormwater, uh, treats it, so it's removing pollution. So what we're looking at right now is both a man-made and a natural solution together. Exactly, yeah, it's using the, the really the, the functionality of wetlands to take up nutrients and, and lock them into the soils over time. And, and these wetlands are, are engineered and managed 
to do just that. With an estimated price tag of $16 billion, Davis hopes these projects will be complete by 2030, helping relieve at least some of these man-made problems. But Florida's ecological troubles are not confined to the mainland. Here in the iconic Florida Keys, the fragile ecosystem is also under attack from worsening water quality. So this was a profound change in the chemistry of the water. Dr. Brian LaPointe has been studying the Keys waters since the 1980s. He recently detected an imbalance, rising nitrogen and plunging phosphorus. Combined with warming waters, he says this has contributed to the demise of the third largest coral reef tract in the world. As they become more and more phosphorus limited, they become more prone to diseases. It's, it's like an immune deficiency. They become weaker, uh, more prone to diseases and coral bleaching. The temperature threshold for coral bleaching can be reduced by several degrees. And that means corals bleach more often, turning bright white, weakening, and often dying due to heat stress. It's become a worldwide epidemic. Scientists estimate most tropical corals will be wiped out by 2050. Living coral cover is about 2% now on the reefs of the Florida Keys. That's, um, that's pretty low, and uh, that's so low, the term coral reef is, is really probably not appropriate anymore. I don't think people realize if they were here and diving the reefs in the 1960s and then they saw it now, they'd be shocked. They would want to come up almost crying, not the, from the salt water in their nose from their mask and snorkel, but from the tears coming from their eyes. Dr. David Vaughn is the founder of Plant a Million Corals. He's working to restore the reef. His big discovery for helping coral came back in 2013 when he thought he had ruined a four year long experiment. I yanked it and I heard a crack and I literally broke one of the first test tube baby corals. But to his surprise, the broken coral grew back at up to 40 times their natural pace, meaning reefs that might normally take hundreds of years to revive now have a chance to be restored in decades. They grew back that same tissue size that took years in just months. So it became an aha moment. His technique of cutting coral into pieces and regrowing them at rapid fire called microfragmentation is now being used all around the Keys and beyond offering a glimmer of hope to these cities under the sea. Our coral restoration program has actually outplanted more than 120,000 corals in the last 10 years or so. Dr. Hannah Cook's team at Moat Marine Laboratory is building on Vaughn's work, growing coral fragments in tanks and then planting them out on the reefs with a survival rate of 90%. So I think people will say the ocean's really big, what you're doing is really just a drop in the bucket. Can it have a big impact? I think restoration can have a big impact, but it's important to know that restoration is not a magic bullet. We need a complex uh, framework assessing different things like water quality, like climate change, like active restoration. Scientists agree a well-rounded, all of the above approach is urgently needed. I think it was, uh... Jacques Cousteau, who said, you poison the ocean, and the ocean will poison you. And so if Florida doesn't deal with this soon? Yeah, then uh, it's going to have dire consequences for, for not just our economy, but the ability to live and enjoy paradise the way we have for many, many years. In the Florida Keys, Jeff Berardelli, CBS News.